Nancy Hensley, welcome to the Sports Management Podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you today. You are the founding member of Mercury 13, uh, together with previous podcast guest, Victor Kodjevina. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is Mercury 13? So Mercury 13 is a multi-club ownership group. We're focused on women's football exclusively and basically going in and investing in getting controlling stakes in women's teams so that we can really reshape the future and unlock the growth potential in women's football. That's super exciting. And as everyone knows, uh, women's football is uh, really on the rise with the Absolutely. NWSL and in also in Europe. So uh, oh yeah, what made you uh, join Mercury 13 and why is this important <laughs> to you? So it's, it's been a passion of mine. It's, I worked in a, a, in a global sports analytics and data company. I was the chief product and marketing officer. And when I was there, I really saw a lot of the inequities around even just the core data collection and the coverage and all of that stuff. It started to see it. And I started to read up about women's footballers, particularly the struggles that they went through. It's very different than in the US. And so it was a big education for me to see that huge difference. And it just really kind of woke something up inside of me from a passion standpoint. And I became a very vocal advocate. And that's how I met Victoire, actually. She was on one of my panels that we had discussing the challenges of women's football. So that's how we met from this, this uh, shared passion. And I think that's what's great about Mercury 13 is it's a group of people that have come together with this core mission because we all not just see the opportunity, but really have a passion for unlocking all the potential that it has. Mm. So both you and Victor has uh, also like a tech background, maybe you mm -hmm. more uh, uh, extensively, but uh, so can you talk a little bit about your background and what you bring to the table now at Mercury 13? Sure. So I come from a big tech background. I spent uh, two decades at IBM, um, always in the data and AI space. So I had several different roles but always focused on data and AI and analytics. Um, the, my last role at IBM was the chief digital officer for the data and AI division. That's kind of a hybrid role between product and marketing, where we just focused on transitioning a lot of our assets to SaaS and growing them and making them more digitally accessible. And then um, I was the chief product and marketing officer at Stats Perform. So I've stuck always in data and AI, uh, always in the technical background. I'm a big data nerd. I love sports. So, you know, ha combining these two things have been great. Mm. So what uh, the tech part now at Mercury 13, what, uh, how are you leveraging that? So we are starting to lay the groundwork for how we're going, how data and tech is going to be a key growth factor for women's football. And when you think about just even the fact that it's very difficult to find stats, that the coverage of women's football isn't great. And so that actually then feeds the fact that we can't get good data from, because a lot of data is collected through video. So if the video coverage is not great, we don't have good data coverage. Um, I think we know that this is one of the things that's hurting us. So not only that hurting our growth, so not only do we need to be a voice, but we need to actually start to push the industry and start to make data and analytics part of our core tenancy of our strategy for how we grow women's football. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be focusing on is how do we leverage the tools? How do we make this part of our strategy, but also being a voice in the industry for, we got to make sure that we're continuing to provide the same level of focus and and equity around data and stats and coverage in women's football as we do in men's. Mm. So it might take some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how can more data help optimize women's sports? I mean, there are so many different uh, angles you can take, yeah. right? This fan engagement, this game analytics performance. So uh, how yeah. do you see that? So, I mean, let's start with fan engagement, right? I think that a lot of us know that fans connect with athletes based on having stats and analytics. And so it's sometimes really difficult to find that in women's football. There are some apps that do a good job, but there's just not enough. Like the core coverage just defaults to men. And then you might see a little bit of women's football. So making that more available also then helps the media and broadcasters because they need content to talk about. What do they like to talk about? They like to talk about stats and analytics, right? And then this new generation of fan, we know that they are very digital and stats driven. And so they like a lot of that integrated into their sports experience. So it really helps from a fan engagement standpoint. 
Um, it also helps for things like just core strategic things that you do in football, like scouting. There are some great scouting tools out there, but they lack the depth of data. On the men's side, there's lots of great data, but we're missing the rise of a lot of these stars, right? And so, and that's terrible. And when you look at even like a, a legend, I, I talk about this all the time, like Sam Kerr, it's difficult to find video coverage and coverage of some of her early career. And she's a legend, right? So um, improving focus on that helps us get more strategic, helps us make better choices from how we build our teams, not just from basic stats on a sheet, but uh, understanding their playing styles and how they fit in better. That's really, really important. And then, um, I mean, there's so many ways we can talk about this for an hour, just on that. And let's talk about injuries, right? We just, speaking of Sam Kerr, right? We now have another star of the game that's gone down with ACL. Mm -hmm. We're just now starting to see, um, organizations like UEFA saying, you know what, maybe we should do something about this, but all of the data and a lot of the injury data in most sports is based on men. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can probably tackle this with more data, more focus on it. This is a huge challenge for women's sports, yeah. women's football in particular. Yeah. No, the ACL injuries frustrates me a lot because it's so common. And as you said, like all the data is on the men's. And I mean, if it's the turf or the shoes, I mean, there are right. now, you know, uh, information about like women's feet are different. The hips are yep. different. So the angle hits the knee in a different way. Or is it how... the increase in play? Like Exactly. Yeah. And like so yeah, with things. recovery or training and that something yeah. hasn't been done yet. This is uh, crazy, but, uh, and yeah. what that something needs is data, yeah. right? <laughs> so that I think it, I think it can really, really help when you think about how it's really evolved the men's game so significantly, it's this, it can do the same for the women's game. Hmm. So what about AI? You specialize also in AI and data driven technology. So how can AI help in uh, these uh, aspects that we mentioned now? So I think let, let's talk about that. Going back to the injuries for a second, like the advancements that we've made in generative AI um, and some of the large language models just will help not only crunch through more of this data, but it make it democratize the access to it for so many people that need it. And I think the biggest challenge we've had with AI, and it was one of the things we tackled um, in my role at Stats Perform, is how do you make it easier to consume? So it's not like a bunch of data scientists sitting in the corner cranking out models. Well, that doesn't help you get that down to the coaching staff or the front line. So how do we operationalize that knowledge so that when a player steps out on the pitch, they know what to do differently to avoid an ACL. And I think that the advancements in generative AI will help us get there. Like my vision has always been that we have this great app that's all um, natural language driven. And it just asks the player in the morning, like, how did you sleep? And how are you feeling? And and where are you in your cycle? And how, you know, how many days till match day? And then it can curate a bunch of information like an advisor right? mm -hmm. and just makes it very easy for the athlete to consume all this information, like where they're at, how many hours they should train, you know, what kind of turf they're going to be training on, how many, uh, how many days until match day, what nutrition, all of that. Right. So, and I think that's some of the things that we can solve with some of the advancements in generative AI. So it's pretty exciting actually. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it sounds to me like some type of wearable, but more focused on the specific sport because you have this I, different nine. I'm not sponsored by any of them, but let's say whoop, for example. So you're yeah. having that it tracks your sleep and it tells you, ah, oh, you should have a light workout today because you haven't rested well right. and so forth, but maybe something more targeted to football, for example. And I, but, and I actually think that the real solution will be something that can, can, that can correlate all that data together. So it doesn't matter what wearable you have, whether it's a Whoop or an Aura or an Apple Watch, that it can just pull that information, consolidate that information, and then actually spit out something to the athlete that is something consumable, right? Mm. Something really, truly operationalized that they can operationalize in their everyday. Mm. If we focus on Mercury 13 again, with regards to data, um, when you are choosing a club that you want to invest in, how are you working with data there to gain as much information as possible to make an educated <laughs> decision? So we, we definitely have a, a diligence approach in what we're looking for in a team that's multifaceted. Obviously we're looking at football performance. We're looking at geographical location. What we feel is really, really important to the success and the sustainability of a 
any women's football team is commercial revenue. So that's where we think our flywheel starts to, to, to run for a team in terms of sustainability. And when you look at the revenue mix between men and women's football, commercial revenue is so core to women. And so if we can really make sure that we can fully commercialize this team, that feeds everything else we want to do, whether it's better resources, whether it's a, a more depth on the roster or changes to the roster, it starts there. So we look at the commercial viability of the team. We look at the team performance. We look at dynamics within the league. So we do a multifaceted approach and each one of us kind of take a different aspect that we look at. And then we bring it all together and, and uh, correlate the data and make a recommendation. Mm. Um, so it's pretty extensive. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And I read that you're focusing on Europe and uh, Latin America first, uh, right? Yes. So is yep. that decision also based on data or how did you? Yeah, I think the there's a, a huge opportunity for the growth that we saw that's already kind of happened in terms of the multiples from in the NWSL that's about to happen in Europe. Um, when you look at a team like Angel City, who just a few years ago paid a franchise fee of what, three or four million dollars, and now their valuation is 186 million, or even just recently the Portland Thorns that sold for 63 million, or my local home team, Chicago Red Stars, that sold for I think 35 million. Um, the multiples are pretty extensive. That is what we think will be happening in Europe. Um, that it is an undervalued asset that just needs the right approach and team to truly unlock all the potential that's there. Mm. Is there a difference if a club also has a professional men's team, uh, for example, let's say Arsenal or PSG versus a club that maybe because there are some Swedish clubs, for example, that they are only mm -hmm. they only have a women's team. They don't have a men's mm -hmm. team. Does that make a difference in how you see it in investing? It doesn't. Um, obviously, it's an easier conversation if they're independent, but I think less than 30% of the clubs in Europe are independent, like women's only. Um, so there's a smaller opportunity of segment of clubs there. So it doesn't make a difference. We're going to look at them either way in terms of what we see as potential. Mm, interesting. In uh... Can analytics go too far? I'm thinking, you know, like uh, analysis by uh, paralysis by analysis, for example. Uh, I I'm always very aware of that. Um, it's one of my leadership styles, actually, to always make sure you're grounded in the why and that you don't kind of rotate too heavy into the analysis or the process reason of it. I think when it comes to sports. Can it go too far? Um, I think that depends on the fan, right? The, for for some fans, having data integrated into the screen goes too far, right? Like my husband, we we have Amazon Prime, so you could watch it. You can watch NFL football two different ways. You can watch it with the data on the screen, or you could just watch it the full screen. I think my husband lasted like five minutes. He's like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> you know, so. To him, that is too far. Having the data on the screen doesn't want it on the, the screen. So really, it's going to be a fan preference. But to me, I think when you know more about the stats than you know about the athlete themselves and their story, that to me goes a little too far because I don't want it to take away from their story, especially in women's football, because a lot of these women have worked really hard and sacrificed so much to be where they are. Uh, I think their story is just as important as their performance stats. Mm. That is interesting. Also, like, is sports betting is a hot topic in uh, in the U.S. Uh, specifically in the U.S. And yeah. uh, is that something that you think could help grow the women's game? <laughs> that is uh, that's such a controversial topic. Mm. I, it, like, if we just talk it from a business standpoint, let's take yeah. all the emotion and how you feel about betting out of it. The reality is that yes, betting would definitely fuel some growth because we know that it has for the men's game, right? And we know that it has for almost every other sport. I mean, let's take an American sport again for an example as a contrast, one that has influenced um, European football quite a bit, which is the NFL, right? And five, six years ago, the NFL was very anti-betting, right? And now I think they're cheerleaders for it. There, if you watch sports in America, there's not a pregame show or even sometimes within the, the coverage, you see a lot of betting statistics. Like that has not happened in Europe yet. Um, but I think Americans are enjoying some of the benefit of sports betting from a local and city standpoint. 
they're enjoying some of the benefits of the revenue. So yes, I do think it can grow a sport. We just have to make the decision on if we go forward with that, how do we maintain a level of responsibility? Because we know that in the UK, there's been some significant challenges and we don't want to promote that. Um, so it's, it's going to be a decision. I think that each club has to make in terms of their values and what they stand for. Um, yes, it can help grow it, but there are other ways to grow it. So. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And also in Sweden, it's, it's always a controversial topic. And I mean, usually these, the, comp the betting companies, uh, can, you know, uh, pay a lot of money for sponsorships, but also yeah. then you have with the with addiction, gaming addiction, and how do you see that? And, you know, of course, it's a controversial topic, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Again, back to Mercury 13, uh, where does the name come from? So that's a great question. So there was a group of astronauts in the late 1960s, all men, right? Everybody knows that went to the moon. There's a group of astronauts that people don't know about that were nicknamed Mercury 13. So the 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 doctor that ran all of the medical testing on the men, um, Dr. Lovelace, he actually funded a private project on his own dime because he was fascinated to see how the women would perform under these same stress test conditions. His theory was that they would perform better. And, and what happened was is that they did, they actually did outperform the men in some categories. So there was one test where they were testing their ability to acclimate into space. And so they would lock them into this dark tank of water, warm water, and see how long they could stay in there. And the men like didn't last more than 45 minutes. There was one woman who lasted, I think, almost nine hours. And so there was a marked difference. And I think her joke was if, if you had as many kids as she had, then, you know, floating in a nice swarm tank for is like a vacation. Um, so he was really excited with the results and he went running to NASA and to say, look at this, like the women outperform the men. And NASA was like, oh, no, no, we can't have that. And so they literally shut down the program. The, the astronauts got a letter from the president of the United States saying this must not, this must stop now. And so they've missed their moonshot just because they were women. And so we see the same kind of parallels with women's football. And you think about like the ban that happened, it was very similar story, right? The ban that happened in the UK didn't happen because women weren't great at football and because no one was interested. It was actually right after several successful matches, like the, the boxing day match with the Dick Kerr ladies, right? That it, it was the same kind of reaction. Like we can't have the women outshadow the men. So it was, so we, that's where we, that's where the inspiration was drawn from is that we want to give these women their rightful moonshot, um, much like what they deserved. And, and I think that there's just so many parallels between what Pat, the history of women's football and, and what's happened to the women of Mercury 13. And one of them did finally go to space, by the way, um, in her eighties. Okay. And, <laughs> so one of them in, did make it she was in her 80s when she went yeah. to space oh yeah wow. it was just a few years ago on one of the um one of the programs i can't remember which one it was but she was either the virgin program um where she was a guest on uh on one of the uh excursions mm. wow impressive mm -hmm. so um yeah so of course then focused on the women obviously and uh, seeing women's football as a business uh, more as, uh, you know, something that's just nice for the women, you know, mm -hmm. it's not a charity, yes. it's a business opportunity. That's so right. how, um, how are you looking at that to really, how are you watching it from a business perspective? So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about is understanding how revenue supports women's football and what types of revenue supports women's football. And we feel very strongly that the commercial base and making that successful and growing is the key to sustainability with women's football. We're not going to, it's not going to be like men's where a majority of the revenue comes from match day and media broadcasts. We're not there yet. So um, we do believe that there's huge potential and we think that those media broadcasts contracts will catch up. We, what we saw happen in the last year with attendance records being broken, 
like time and time again is actually starting to push more value into the contracts. And we saw that in the NWSL one where it was 40 times bigger. Well, I think we'll see that time and time again in all of the regional contracts around Europe as well. But for now, we've got to focus on making sure that commercial revenue is there, the merchandising, the sponsorships, like helping brands see that sponsoring women's football is a great investment for their brand. And it's not just a great investment because they can say they sponsor sports, but also as a part of like a bigger movement that's going on around women's empowerment that we see so strong globally. And you think of some of the brands that like, well, let's take Taylor Swift, right? Everybody's talking about Taylor Swift um, or the Barbie movie, like all of these huge things that have brought in so much money, just kind of validate that there is some there there around women's empowerment. And that is so foundational women's football. And so brands that really want to focus on women and women as a consumer, this is a great opportunity. And so that's where we're really focused is that whole commercial aspect to, to really amp up the business and unlock the potential. Yeah. No, um, Taylor Swift must be one of the best thing that happened to football because it brings <laughs> in an audience that they never had before. That's right. There are people, I, and it, there's, it's, there's, it's so much fun to watch this on, on uh, social media about people who just never cared about the Kansas City Chiefs or NFL, but care if she's at the game. Yeah. <laughs> she was at the game yesterday. Yeah, with her <laughs> specially made jacket and in the yeah. cold and with everything, you know. So, uh, no, that's like the ultimate crossover. Yeah. Uh, but talking about the commercial opportunities. Uh, it's important in my point of view to see women's football as its own product. It's very often mm -hmm. just you take something that worked for the men and you make a copy paste into the women's game. Yeah. So to making the commercial opportunities that we talked about, what are some key things that needs to be tailored, you feel, for women's football? I think the number one thing is to really understand the woman's football fan. We've been talking about this for quite some time because um, it's a different fan. It's a different fan base. And there is a big chunk of that fan base that are women. So focusing on that fan base and building a great experience and then aligning with sponsors and partners that align with that, I think is really, really critical foundation. Mm -hmm. So when I talked to uh, Victor Kojivina a couple of, I don't know if it was a year ago or something, she talked about, mm -hmm. you know, the smallest things, smallest adjustments, like uh, you can uh, you can offer different drinks, like an, uh, mm -hmm. you know, oat milk, oat milk latte, I think her example was in the cafeteria or just something else that appeals yeah. to the different fan base. Absolutely. So if you, it, it's you, and you have to look at it in multiple aspects, the actual match day, the experience at the stadium itself. She also talks about like, cause she's got a baby, like it's hard for her to bring a pram into the stadium. The stadium experience was not built for women and, and, and build it for women and children, but the audience of women's football is women and young girls. Right. And it's the same thing here in the U S um, like when I go to a Chicago Red Stars game, it's there. What's interesting is that when the game, when the match is over, all the parents kind of stay sitting where they're sitting and the kids just run down to the pitch and the players then come and meet up with the kids and they will spend like an hour. It's a very different experience than any other major league sport that you go to. And so I think that you understand the fan, you understand how to change the experience and capitalize on that. And then not just like understanding the fan, but who exactly they are, what they want, what kind of brands they shop, what partners would be good for that. It's like an all encompassing experience. And she's right. Like the smallest things, the menus at the stadiums were again, not designed for women. The experiences most for the, for the most part, weren't designed for women. Um, the sponsors, right? Like all around, like if you just say, this is a clean slate, we're going to build this around the fan and we're going to build this around growing the business. I think you have a completely different aspect. I'm actually reading, um, it's a book called the club, which is about the rise of the premier league. And it's interesting to see how, wh where that commercialization and all of the, the, influences and the things that they did and the things that they did that didn't work. Like I had no idea that they had, um, cheerleaders at crystal palace which i think is pretty funny i guess we went to a dallas cowboys game was like yeah that's what we need in football is cheerleaders i just can't see that working um 
but it but it, it I, I re, I'm reading it because I really want to understand the things that they stumbled on and the things that they did. But I don't, we, none of us want to just take this and say, let's just take a, a blueprint of the, of the men's side and rebuild it. We don't want to do that. We're looking at how do we build this in a sustainable way? How do we build this around the fan? How do we actually build this so that the athlete gets to, has her full potential unlocked? Um, and I think it's going to be very different than how the Premier League grew up. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. How about that? Because there must be m male fans that goes to the women's games as well, right? Yeah. So you yeah, so you need to find that mix also to how do you if they maybe maybe they have similar interests uh, as the female fans. I don't know, but like maybe to know your fans and then we go back to data. Yeah. Maybe you can you know gain that information yeah. what they like and not like and so forth. Absolutely, absolutely. We know they're younger. We know that they're more educated. We know that they're, it's split between men and women, actually. Um, it's more family focused. So there are some things we know, but I think there's a lot more we need to know and really double down on who is coming to, who's supporting these teams. Yeah. So in, I haven't been to a soccer game in the US, but in uh, in Europe, it's uh, not considered very family friendly every time. It's uh, this... Uh, it's a smaller group, but they make a lot of noise and with the, you know, the the mm -hmm. fires and their chants and so forth. And maybe if you're a parent with a young kid, you don't feel 100% safe. So that's something yeah. I feel like in the women's game, uh, when what you have seen, it's a completely different atmosphere. It is very different. Um, and I've been to Premier League games and I've been to games in Europe. Um, the games here on the NWSL side are very, very family focused. I would say 40% of the audience is families, lots of young girls, young boys, um, college age boys, um, or men. Uh, it's a very young crowd and it's a very diverse crowd as well. So it's mm. not, um, it, it, I think in some Premier League clubs you don't see as much diversity, <laughs> but in like I, I and I can speak more from the experience of my local team. It's a very very diverse uh, segment of of fans. Hmm. So, going back to how you started, I'm interested in you know your your journey and up until where you are. So I found that uh, your first job was as a dressing room attendant uh, in uh, v <laughs> Oh, you really did some digging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, that was my first job. <laughs> so, you know, from, from that and then going on to work for these major brands, you know, McDonald's, IBM, and now Mercury yeah. 13. How how did it start? How was your journey uh, oh up my until gosh. today? <laughs> The funny thing is, is that I, um, I really did not want to be on the business side. My goal was to be a therapist, a psychologist. And so that's what my degree is actually in. Um, and as I was finishing up school and I was doing an internship at a drug rehabilitation center downtown, and it was really tough work. Um, and I was also working at a crisis center. One of my friends was starting a consulting company and he's like, oh, you always have great ideas. Like just, just come work for us part-time, you know, like while you're finding a job that pays you more than like five cents an hour. <laughs> and that's kind of how I got sucked in was um, just kind of working with my friends and then getting in on the consulting side. And, and the next thing I knew I was on the tech track. So it wasn't actually where I intended to be. Um, but along my career, I just kind of let the road take me to, you know, and I just kind of followed it. So I was, uh, I was working for a consulting company. I was, uh, I was sold to McDonald's as a consultant. And then McDonald's eventually said, just come work for us. And then that I got to do a lot of international travel and that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I was recruited by IBM. So it was, uh, it was a path that ended up being really good. I was, um, IBM was a great place to grow up as a woman in tech. Uh, I was a single mom for several years and it was the best place to be, um, especially as a woman in tech and as a single mom in tech, because they were always extremely supportive. Mm. That's great to hear. And I mean, it speaks to that also because you were a decade at McDonald's and two decades at IBM, right? So yeah. yep. You're not so long in one company if you're not having a good time. That's right. Yeah. But a switch from psychology to tech, you said, like, that's a big one. They are very <laughs> different, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. 
So was that uh, was that difficult to take, or was it just the natural progression of things? I think I'm insanely curious about a lot of things, and so when I started, I I was self taught on the tech side. And I don't even remember like specifically how I did it. <laughs> to be honest, I think it was just kind of thrown in. And I, cause I, when I started doing the consulting side, I was more on the, like the marketing and comm side and through my career I kind of bounced between the tech side and, you know, marketing and comms. Like I, it, which I think has, has made me more of a multifaceted executive over time. Um, but I, I, I think it's just, a, it was you know, I was the person who would roll my sleeves up when I was at McDonald's and actually program the POS system because I wanted to learn how to do it. <laughs> like, so I think it's just that insane curiosity all the time of learning. And, and one of the things that I love about this role too, is that I'm learning so much about not just football, but the history of football and how it's evolved. And, um, cause we didn't have the same level of exposure here in the U S. And so it, to me, it's really, really fascinating. I've read several books and listened to lots of podcasts about uh, the early days of football, the history of football, how it's grown. Um, and, and it's fascinating. It really is. Mm. So you have played a lot of sports. I read also basketball, football, volleyball, yep. track and field. Uh, yep. So, so these sports, and also I read that you have, I think you said that you're a lifetime data nerd. So then now, <laughs> yeah. so now I think these two interests have, uh, you know, melted together with Mercury 13, the tech yeah. and the sports side. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely, definitely grew up loving sports. Um, remember in really young watching the baseball games on TV with my dad, loved to go to the baseball games, um, watching football, like my dad always had sports on all the time. Um, and then, like I said, I tried almost every sport that just because I loved, like I said, I think that was that curiosity, like, oh, I wonder what it's like to play basketball. Oh, I wonder what it's like to play football. Oh, I wonder what it's like to play floor hockey. So um, I was not, I never really committed to one more than track and field. I think I ran track and field for a couple of years um, and, you know, it started to work. So I did had, I had less time for sports, but it was a lot of fun trying different things. I'm sure. So although you didn't study like the STEM studies, I know that that's something that you're very dedicated to, to inspire more women and girls to go mm -hmm. into STEM studies. So uh, how are, I know you're working with WIST, for example. So uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, how, how are you working to get more women into to STEM studies? I mean, any chance I get, I will try and pay it forward, talk to somebody. There's people that reach out to me all the time on LinkedIn. Um, I'll speak at schools. I'll speak at universities. I am a mentor for women in sports tech um, for their fellowship program. Um, I still mentor a lot of the fellows that I that I had in the past. Uh, Girl Con was something that I always commit to doing every year because we with STEM we don't we kind of lose them like they they will say they want to be a scientist or they want to do things when they're younger and then we kind of lose them somewhere around high school. So getting them in the in that grade school or middle school age is really important. That's what GirlCon focuses on. So no matter what I do, I always say like I will be a GirlCon to talk about um, getting into tech and more specifically sports tech. And what amazes me is that a lot of these girls had no idea sports tech was a thing. Like they didn't know they could go do something in sports tech, whether they're a lawyer or an accountant or a marketing or a product person. They just didn't know it was an opportunity. And so I think it's so important for young girls to understand that that path is there for them. We need more women in sports tech. We need more women in AI, right? And that helps us manage some of the gender biases we develop these models, but we, and we need more women in sports. Like it's still, when I came, when I moved over from IBM into sports tech, I felt like I went back, you know, 20 years in terms of seeing the, the diversity, everything we'd fought for on the women in tech side, it's there's still a fight on the sports and sports tech side. So I will do anything I can to help that at any time. Cause I think it's really important that they see a path and that they see somebody who's been on that path. Yeah. Of course to have role models and someone to look up to. And uh, are you doing some mentor mentoring or? As oh well? yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I do. Yep. <laughs> Is that through WIST and uh, girl con or? Some, but yeah, some with some that have just reached out to me, um, some even previously from other companies that like, I still have people I mentor at IBM still people I have mentor at stats perform. So, 
I try and do as much as I can. I try not to say no. And then I get a little overwhelmed, but it's, it's worth it. It's when I was early in my career and I was looking for someone who I could look up to, to kind of give me the hope and inspiration about staying on the path in tech when there was times when it was tough, um, there wasn't as many options. And so I kind of made that mental decision that if I made it, that I would pay it forward, then I still try and do that. Yeah. On that topic, what would be your best advice for women who wants to pursue a career in sports? I think that it's important for them to understand that there are so many jobs within sports that they may not realize. They, you, and, it, and even if you are like, I want to be a lawyer, or I want to be an accountant, or I want to be in marketing, you could do all those things in sports. And I think they just, they're not thinking about it. They just kind of think more of the mainstream and everybody thinks that in order to be in sports, you had to have been like a, an athlete at some point. <laughs> That's not the case. Um, in fact, there's a lot of people in sports that never played professional sports like me. Um, so you don't have to be that. So to just know that the path is there and that it is a huge growing business and that sports isn't just business, isn't just important to us as humans emotionally, but it's important to the economy. Like it's, it is a big, it is a, a contributor to the global GDP by I think 1%, like that's pretty significant. Um, so it's, it is important. It was, it's the thing that connects us. It's the thing that unites us and it's a great business to be in mm. and we need more women. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, I mean, is it only to take that like the uh, educational path or also maybe internships is a great way to know yep. what you learn, uh, what you like and not like? Yeah. And I think for, I think having a passion for sports definitely helps. And so if you are somebody who is on a professional path in any role and you have a passion for sports, you know, just figure out how you combine those two things. And sometimes you could do it locally. Like you could be, you could help with your local college team if you're still in university and you can do stats or you can, you can be on the medical side or you can be on the training side or you can be even on the financial side or you could be on the art and videography or social media side. Like there's so many opportunities to jump in even at the college level um, or university level th that helps lay that opportunity for an internship. And then, you know, obviously WIST is another great organization that's working really hard to put women into sports tech specifically. And hopefully we see more organizations like that. Women's sports, women's sports foundation also works very hard to create those pathways for women. Um, so I think we're starting to see that change happen um, more and more, much more so than, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Maybe some entry-level jobs will open up in Mercury 13 also. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, has there been any bumps on the road in your career? And if so, how did you <laughs> overcome them? Oh my gosh. There's always bumps in your career, right? Um, I remember very early in my IBM days, as my my star was kind of on the rise, I ran into this one woman who just decided she didn't like me because maybe she was jealous, I'm not sure. And she just did everything she could to make my life miserable. And you kind of have to make a decision at that point. Um, do you respond or do you just kind of stay your path, right? And And that's kind of how I how I responded then. And how I respond to anything is that, you know, keep your integrity, keep your focus, stay kind, stay authentic, stay true to yourself and your principles and, and who you are, because those bumps are going to hit and, you know, you're going to have run into people that give you a hard time or, you know, maybe don't, maybe don't like you or, or disagree with you or um, a job that's not the right fit. Right. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes you could be the right job, the wrong boss, the wrong boss, the right job, like all of those things, you can't take it personally. And so, uh, and that's a learning curve in and of itself. Right. Um, but just my secret really has been to just stay very true to who I am and not change. Mm. And do you like endure in this type or do you, you know, look for change or what do you think? Maybe think it's. I think the answer to that is it depends, right? Mm. And some of those mild things you endure, you power through it because um, like the example that I gave you, um, mm. if it is, if you're in a really toxic environment, 
then absolutely don't endure because it's not worth it. There are lots of opportunities and you got to be like a flower, go plant yourself where you can grow in the sunlight and not wither <laughs> and in an, in an environment that's not good for you. Yeah. Approaching the end here, is there something I haven't asked you yet that you feel is important to mention? <laughs> I think it's important to mention to tell everybody to watch women's sports, to um, work, to go buy the brands that support women's sports, to be advocates because we need all the advocates, right? We need people talking about it. We need people watching it so that we get more focus on the media side. We need people to be really vocal about it. So we get the attention of the media as well. So that would be what I would say. <laughs> support women's sports. Support women's sports. It's good business to support women's sports too. Definitely. Then the final question that I ask everyone is uh, who from your network do you think would be a good guest on this podcast? Oh, wow. Um, I, I think that anybody who was a former player um, Ariana Cristioni on our team or any Luco, like somebody who's played somebody who's kind of endured the challenges of being a woman, a professional women's football player is a great choice because when you hear their stories and you hear what they had to endure, what they've sacrificed just to play football, like to me, that's really inspirational. Um, and I think more, more, people out there need to understand that these professional football players weren't making millions and millions of dollars. They didn't have an easy life. They didn't have the cushy travel. They didn't have the beautiful fields. And so having people be able to tell their stories, I think is really important. Definitely. And that's a really good point also that uh, these women that they paid and they not only didn't they make money, they probably lost money to play because yeah. they lost out of their regular job and then still perform on a professional level. So yeah, that, that's yeah. good uh, good advice. I will hope, <laughs> see if I can make that happen. Excellent. Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Sports Management Podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.